Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for tonight's Preservation School class about the New York City Department of Records Information Services and Municipal Archives. Our 2022-2023 Preservation School series is featuring classes with representatives from New York City agencies. You can learn about these agencies' missions and how they engage with historical neighborhoods, buildings, and sites. The 2023 class schedule will be announced soon. We hope you will join us for the entire series. Tonight's class will be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel for free, free viewing. You may also watch all of our previous Preservation School classes and virtual tours on our YouTube channel. In addition to our virtual programming, we have a Six to Celebrate Parkchester tour in person coming up this Saturday, November 12th. Please check out our website, hdc.org, for more information and to sign up. If you have any questions about pro programming, you can contact me at M-A-R-B-U lu at hdc.org. I want to thank the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, City Council, and the New York State Council on the Arts for supporting Preservation School. Now I will hand it over to the Department of Records and Information Service Assistant Commissioner Kenneth Cobb to lead tonight's class. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you for, for inviting me to participate in your Preservation School featuring city agencies. In this case, the agency being the Municipal Archives. And we're going to talk a little bit tonight about what you might find relative to historic buildings and neighborhoods, as well as a lot of other stuff. So I want to kind of give you a virtual, we'll start with a virtual tour of the archives, highlighting major collections, and then focus on some of the records useful for preservation related research. So let's get situated. We're right here in the heart of the Civic Center. This is our headquarters in the Surrogates Court Building at 31 Chambers Street. It's where we have our offices, conservation lab, digital lab, processing areas, as well as the public rooms and some storage. This is one of my favorite pictures of the building. It's a rare color transparency dated about 1939. The atrium considered one of the most beautiful public interior spaces in the city. Very beautiful, right? Well, recently I came across something called a plan for New York Civic Center. It's dated 1964. The architect was Edward Durrell Stone, one of Rockefeller's pet architects, I believe. And um, City Hall was there, you can see it on the right. But Tweed was gone, the Tweed Courthouse was gone replaced by an, an office tower connected to City Hall by kind of a sunken shopping arcade. Would have been nice enough, I guess. And it was had to happen in two phases. Here's phase one, and you can see the surrogate's court is sitting there in the corner. Phase two, we're gone. How, you know, how can that possibly be? How could they tear down this, you know, this beautiful marble palace? Well, how can they tear down Penn Station? Um, it was the 60s, what can you say? But luckily this was a little bit too late and the surrogates court was one of the first buildings designated as a landmark in 1966. And uh, before we get into the collections, I just want to mention that we recently opened our new state-of-the-art storage facility in Industry City, Brooklyn uh, storage room. And here's our one of the, the new reading room we have with these beautiful views to the, to the west there. We're up on the seventh floor, it's very, very nice. So anyway, as I said, the Municipal Archives is a city agency, or actually I should say part of a small city agency known as the Department of Records and Information Services. We date back to, the department dates back to 1977 when Paulo Dwyer, who was then the city council president and other city leaders, decided to create a, create a separate agency, the Department of Records Information Services, that emerged the municipal archives with the, uh, together with the city's records management program, also established in, which, uh, the archives was established in 1952 along with the records management program. And which just, just so you know, they manage about a million boxes for the 50 city agencies, the courts and the district attorneys. This is our warehouse in Queens. And together with the municipal library, 
which was established in 1913. And at this point, I just want to uh, pause and say that although my presentation tonight is about the archives, we shouldn't forget about the Municipal Library. It's, it's a fantastic resource and really deserving of its own program. So perhaps we'll come back another day for that. So I wanna start this by talking about the mayors. Why the mayors? Well, since the mid 19th century, the city has had a mayoral centric form of government basically coinciding with the establishment of essential city services, such as water, sewers, health, police, fire, and so on, all mostly under jurisdiction of the mayor. So the mayor has had a lot of power. And like the wide ranging powers of the mayors, their records are correspondingly diverse. You'll find documentation about literally every conceivable topic, local, national, even international, in the uh, archives collection collection of mayor records. They date back to about the 1850s. They become more substantial after consolidation in 1898. And they really were good right through the uh, progressive era. But I'm gonna jump ahead to Mayor Jimmy Walker, 1920s. And his collection is actually rather extensive, but he's, he's oddly absent from the records. When you look at it, it seems like his secretaries and assistants handled most of the day-to-day -day work Maybe because he wasn't in the office uh, very often. This seems to have been more of his sort of preferred hangout. That's the legend anyway. I think he may need a, a kind of a closer look uh, because there were some significant um, accomplishments to, during his term, such as planning construction of the planning and construction of the West Side Highway, for example. It's long gone, of course, but there were some interesting arch architectural flourishes in there that some of you may remember. Then there's Mayor LaGuardia. He had phenomenal energy. He, he was involved in everything and you can see it in his papers. He obviously read every single letter, memo. He made notes, he wrote the response. It's quite extraordinary. And thanks to the billions of depression fighting dollars that he leveraged from the federal government in the 30s. He saved the city, but he also created huge new infrastructure and new services. And since then, of course, maintenance of this infrastructure and programs with less and less, with fewer and fewer federal dollars continues to be kind of a challenge. New York City Housing Authority being, an, being a good example of that. Next up is Mayor O'Dwyer, 1945. 1946. Here he is with Joe DiMaggio. Historians generally agree that he was, he was a good mayor. He was certainly a very popular one. He easily won his second election in 19, uh, 1949. Here he is with his new wife, Sloan Simpson. She was a model from Texas. And there with a borrowed child in Central Park. But in 1950, just a few months into his second term, President Truman appointed him ambassador to Mexico. Interesting story, we'll save that for another day. And here they are leaving City Hall after a farewell ceremony. Interesting story. Now with O'Dwyer's resignation, the city council president became mayor. That's Vincent Impalitari. Um, it's pretty much acknowledged that he was, he was in over his head. Um, he, Impey's the man in the middle there. And he pretty much did what he was told to do by people such as our friend Robert Moses. So let's step away from the mayors for a minute and talk about Robert Moses and his papers. Quoting Professor Jackson here, single-minded genius, et cetera, et cetera. He's probably at the peak of his powers in the 1950s, holding about a dozen city and state positions simultaneously. And we have a huge collection of his records as parks commissioner, but they're not just about parks. There's documentation about everything he was involved in, such as highways. Here's the boat basin and the Henry Hudson Parkway on Manhattan's west side. The Grand Central Parkway with the famous overpasses that were too low for buses to pass beneath. Swimming pools, this is the Astoria pool, one of the largest pools in the world apparently. 
the Henry Hutt bridges, the Henry Hudson Bridge under construction. Beaches, he built the Orchard Beach in the Bronx, very handsome. He built the United Nations. He built both world fairs. And he always hired the best architects and engineers. So even this little comfort station in the Bronx, in a Bronx park is really a very handsome building. And he was also a master of public relations. His collection is full of promotional items like this flyer here. Oh, and he was a really, he was a great letter writer too. Um, one of the most, one of the important ladies who was vastly excited about the whole thing did not turn up at all and sent no message. I say it's spinach. Who writes like that? All right, let's go back to the mayors. Mayor Wagner, 1954, he's the man to the left of the litter bug. And yes, the model is standing in the litter basket with JFK. Now Wagner is credited with launching the largest municipal public housing program in the nation on top of what LaGuardia began. He, author he also authorized city workers to unionize and he was very good on civil rights. Now, a little while ago, uh, we were preparing an exhibit on new immigrants, and I came across this letter in his papers. Now, it's hard to read, I realize that. But it's the cover letter that Wagner sent to Congressman Emanuel Seller from Brooklyn, who was co-sponsoring the bill to reform the legislation, uh, immigration law. And Wagner was expressing his support, as you can see here. This legislation is long overdue to rectify past injustices and so on. And notice who's CC'd here, RFK, that's Robert F. Kennedy and Senator Javits and Senator Hart. Just sort of a little bit, well, never mind. Anyway, um, so it was a different time. Let's just leave it at that. But I think we can say that that change in the immigration law, which did happen in 1965, has a lot to do with the revival of New York City and or its repopulation of a lot of cities around this country. Next up, Mayor Lindsay. Here he is with Alfred Hitchcock, think about 1966. Again in 1973, late in his, to the end of his term, the man never took a bad picture, it's unbelievable. But it was a complicated time and I really can't sum up his administration in just a few words, but here's something I came across. A report about the conditions of Central Park, this is 1972, growing problems. Um, but because of our efforts to make it an attractive, inviting place, and you skip to the end there, parts of the park are quite literally dying from overuse, et cetera, et cetera. It's 1972. The park is the symbolic center of the city's recreational life. This is what it looked like after concert in the 1970s. In comes Abe Beam. 1974, here he is with Cary Grant. I have no idea what the two are talking about, except possibly that they were wearing the same suit. City fiscal crisis, the city was falling apart. This is the South Bronx, subways, a mess, and so on. 1978, in comes Mayor Koch. Or maybe I should say LaGuardia part two. Like him, he was everywhere all the time. And although he did not have the federal resources that LaGuardia did, if anyone can be given credit for the city coming back or at least setting that in motion, it would be gosh. David Dinkins, what happened to David Dinkins? Huh, oh, there, oh, there he goes. Okay, never mind, Mayor Koch. There's David Dinkins. Okay, 1990, bad economy, high murder rate, crack epidemic, terrible racial incidents, but. Here he is with Nelson Mandela. I think that may have been one of the highlights of his term in office. Mayor Giuliani, good mayor, bad mayor, weird mayor. That's for you to say, that's Joan Rivers with him. But I think you could say that by the end of his second term, he was not so popular until 9-11. And we do have a considerable collection of records pertaining to the uh, aftermath of the attack. All right, enough about him. Let's shift gears a little bit. Um, the way I put it is, <clears throat> the archives has the most comprehensive collection of records pertaining to the administration of criminal justice 
in the English speaking world. They date back to the 1600s and right up to the 1980s. They're in various formats. This is the Bertillon card. And you might think that Lucy Schramm, her name is, her crime was that hat, but apparently she was arrested for being a badger. I don't actually know what that is. We also have like, uh, we have felony. This is a felony indictment against Nellie Doyle. She'd been arrested for stealing $60, which was considered grand larceny in 1887. She took a plea to a second degree, grand larceny in the second degree, and she got the state pen for two and a half years for stealing 60 bucks. Now, the point about this is not about crime in the city or and so forth. It's about what they tell us about the people, who they were, where they came from, their occupations. Because for many or most of these people in these records, this, in, this interaction with government may be the only documentation of their existence. Nellie was apparently from Cuba. She had no particular home. She has no particular occupation. We also have what we call the docket books. These are from the Manhattan District Attorney's Homicide Bureau. We open up 1980 to December 8th. Day of arrest, December 9th. Uh, this might look familiar to you. Name of deceased, Lennon, comma, John Winston. And until fairly recently, that would have been kind of the end of the criminal justice story. That is to say, what we have is mostly from the courts and the district attorneys. But um, nothing from the NYPD, but recently that has changed. There are now two very important collections here, uh, kind of related from the NYPD. The Special Investigation Unit records, they date from the 50s to the early 70s. They, invest, they pretty much investigated any person or organization that deviated from the norm, either on the right or on the left. Turns out, and it turns out police officers are, are very good historians, or archivists. They were meticulous in documenting their activities and picking up stuff that no one would have saved otherwise. And from the NYPD, we have their crime scene photographs, 1920s to about 1970, 120,000 pictures. All right, now let's step back in time. Let's go back about 400 years. We have the records of the first Dutch colonial settlers. It seems like they walked off the boats and started buying and selling property and suing one another and insulting one another. In the course of those transactions, they created records written in Dutch. Luckily, they've all been translated and they've been scanned and digitized and published and printed. They're pretty good shape. We also have records of many of the towns and villages in Brooklyn and Queens and Richmond counties prior to consolidation with New York City in 1898, such as this um, Emancipation Proclamation from 1806. So thanks to New York State's gradual emancipation law that said that any child born to an enslaved woman would be automatically freed at the age 21 for men or 20 for girls. So to keep track of that, the slave owners were required to go before a town official and report the birth of these children. Now, of course, the irony is that civil registrations of the births of non-enslaved persons do not begin until 1847. But we know Tom was born in 1806. Problem with this, of course, is what name did Tom take when he was freed when he was 21 years old? It's kind of frustrating not to know. Another important 19th century collection are the almshouse records. The almshouse was where the city could, took care of people who were indigent, it, too sick to take care of themselves. These were mostly institutions located on what is now Roosevelt Island. And the registers of, of their so-called inmates uh, give you good demographic information here. We know that John uh, Moran was born in County Mayo. That's very unusual to find a specific place like that in the town of Castle, Castle Bar, I think it says. And then he had a daughter named Annie. All right, now I promised you we'd focus on records that document the built environment. Now, one of the key collections that's probably very familiar to you are the so-called 1940 tax photographs. 
they were originally created by the Department of Finance as part of their real estate tax assessment process. Here's a picture of every building in all five boroughs, 720,000 pictures. They've all been digitized and they're all now you can view them on our website. Then of course, in the 1980s, they redid the pictures this time in color. So we'll go back, here's the Sheffield Farms in 1940. And here it is in about 1985. Still a handsome building, but a little bit, a little bit rough at this point. Now, we have two big collections documenting the great public works achievements of the 19th century, the Broken Bridge. We have about 8,000 drawings, engineering drawings, all the original engineering drawings, and 1,500 drawings of the Central Park. And speaking of infrastructure, we have good documentation of the city's waterfront. The city always recognized the importance of maritime activities to its economy and invested very heavily over the decades. Here's the construction of the Chelsea Piers. They were built in the early 20th century specifically to accommodate the new Titanic class of ocean liners coming from Europe, like the Lusitania and the, uh, again, here's the uh, Chelsea Piers, like the Lusitania and the Olympic. Now, of course, the Titanic never made it, but we do have this picture of the rescue ship, the Carpathia, coming into the dock. Here are the plans for a nice elevation of the Chelsea Piers. Here's a, uh, another piece of it there. And uh, by Warren and Wetmore were the architects. City hired the best architects available at the time for this. All right, now I wanna look at some, uh, a little more in depth at some of the series that you might use to document buildings in historic districts or really anywhere for that matter. Here's a, um, first up is the Manhattan Building Plans and Permits. Now beginning in 1866, anyone who wished, a building, who wished to build a building or alter a structure in New York City, that is Manhattan really, they had to file an application with the Department of Buildings with plans. And in the 1970s, the DOB had the idea to save space by microfilming these accumulated records and disposing of the originals. <clears throat> Luckily, the preservation community got wind of this and, the, and halted the project. But they had microfilmed the records from the battery up to about 34th Street. And instead of disposing of them, they, of the originals, it was decided to transfer to the archives. And since then, we have been gradually processing these records. I like the detail of this office building here for the New Jersey Sink Company. It's on Maiden Lane. Now the permits, which associated with the plans, came in their original folders, labeled by block and lot number and address, with kind of an index of all the applications that were contained, the, the permit applications that were contained within. And there was good stuff in there. Here's the new building application filed by, filed by George B. Post in 1890 for a nurse's building on 16th Street, valued at about $150,000. And you can see a lot of details about it, uh, all kinds of dimensions. It's what it was gonna be used for and so on. It's hard to read, I'm sorry about that. Here's the 1917 specifications to uh, an alteration application that was filed in 1917 by Raymond Hood for a hotel and restaurant on Bleecker Street. And here's another piece of that. Oh, I'm sorry, this, yeah. And here's a letter from Cass Gilbert in 1905 for a new building that he was putting up and just quote here a little bit. Uh, First, uh, the drawings will show that the construction is to be first class in every particular. The building shall be strictly fireproof and one of the best type of construction throughout. In other words, to make it one of the finest office buildings in the world. And here's um, number one Wall Street, which generated a lot of correspondence concerning its bulk. 
And here it says, if you notice, someone scribbled on here, building should comply with height regulations. And I believe that eventually it did. All right now, let's look at another series that's helpful in dating, dating when a building was constructed, the records of assessed valuation. I recently came across this newsletter from our friends in Greenwich Village about their effort to landmark a building at 50 West 13th Street. Most, most recently, it was a, a theater. And <clears throat> here it is in 1980, just FYI. About 1985, I should say. Now, the article said it was an 1846 house. Now, remember I said the DOB collection only dates back to 1866. So how do they date the building? Well, one way is to use the tax assessment records. Now, since property in Manhattan was assessed annually, and these records go back to the early 19th century, by following the description of the property, working back very carefully, you can, um, you can use this to determine at least the year when a building was constructed, like this entry for 50 West 13th Street in 1846. Now it's a little bit hard to read, but now if you notice the assessor has penciled in the word house after the one lot. So in other words, now in 1840, as of 1846, it's one lot and a house. So that's, at least that's one way you can use these records to uh, date the building. They also provide information about the owner, and later after, I believe at some point, the description of property gets much more um, specific in terms of feet and inches and number of stories high and so forth. Now, another series that we like a lot of the so-called property cards. Now, you remember I mentioned the uh, tax vote in the 1940 tax photos? Well, those pictures were taken by the Department of Finance as part of their real estate tax assessment process. In the 1930s, they created these cards where they recorded essential information about the building, such as its classification, dimensions. Uh, you can see there's a little sketch of its um, of the dimensions of the building, of the the lay. The, it's like a plot plan there, and they also recorded conveyance information. Oh. Here's the 1940 picture, just a little bit better version of it. Conveyance information, which they updated, as you can see, right up through the 1940s. And apparently somebody in 1952 took out a mortgage on the property. They're a great resource. The finance department updated these cards really right from the 19, 30s right up to the 1980s, and we took them into the archives about uh, about 10 years ago. Oh, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned this is, of course, Alex Austin's house in Staten Island. Oh, and um, here's another picture of the house in our WPA Writers Project, the Federal Writers Project photograph collection. This picture was probably taken about 1936. And here's again, yet another picture from the 19, the 1980s version of the tax photos, um, this time in color. All right, let's go back to our friends in the Department of Buildings again for one more series. And that's their docket books, in which they separately recorded all the incoming new building and alteration applications. So let's say you're researching the old tunnel garage, which was in Tribeca gone now. Maybe you'd like to know, you know, when it was built and who was the architect. Here it is in the mid-1980s. Doesn't look too bad, really. So here we go. Here's the new building application docket. And if we look at the entry for the tunnel garage, number Application number 188 of 1922, which they say it was a two-story fireproof garage and gives you the dimensions, the location, and the architect, Hector C. Hamilton. So there you go. Now, I want to just also talk a little bit about how you can research the people 
who live in the built environment of the city. We've got some really pretty extraordinary collections, the most um, voluminous of which is probably the historical vital records. By that, I mean 13.3 million historical birth, death, and marriage records, which um, by the way, have now been digitized and they're accessible at no charge on our website. They're beautiful color images. It's really quite extraordinary. Let's go back to our house on our little house on 13th Street. Now the Greenwich Village people wrote about a little bit more about it here, said that the house belonged to and was the home for decades of one of New York's most prominent 19th century African American citizens, Jacob Day, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he was, um, let's see what is at the end there. He was a caterer, as you can see, they, they found an ad for him there and he died in the late 19th century. So uh, doing a little sleuthing in our historical vital records collection, I managed to find his death certificate. There you go. He died in 1884. He had been born in New York and Check out the uh, occupation, caterer. So we've got the right man. And using, using that um, historical records, we can find birth, death, marriage, his wife, the marriage record of his, everybody, it's all there. So the many few people really had it right on. And one other collection I wanna mention here, 1890 census, um, sometimes called the police census. It was a special census that the city took that year conduct, they used using police officers as enumerators because the city had realized that the federal count was flawed. It was a city of immigrants at the time, many of whom just simply were not counted, if that sounds familiar. Um, unfortunately, in the end, the federal government did not accept the city's recount, but we eventually wound up with this census. It doesn't record the same information as you would find on the federal census, but at least it's better than nothing. And again, here's our Day family at 50 West 13th Street, Charles Day. I believe that was his son and various other relatives. So um, if you remember that picture of Central Park, uh, our friends at the Central Park Conservancy shared this picture with me just to sort of end this on a little bit of a happier note. Um, Actually, I just want to jump ahead a little bit. I wasn't sure how much time we would have, but if you're interested in birth records, for example, we have Humphrey Bogart's birth certificate. He was born on Christmas Day, 1899, and his mother was Maud Humphrey, so I guess that's where he got his name. Here's another one we like very much. The record, marriage record of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. We have three Roosevelts on there, Franklin, Eleanor, and Eleanor's um, uncle, and their uncle Theodore Roosevelt, who witnessed the marriage. And this is one of our favorites too. F. Scott Fitzgerald's and Zelda's marriage license, in which occupation he puts down writer. Well, I guess so. They were married in New York City in April 1920. And you can never get enough of these tax photos. This is uh, 1940, 1985, it's held up pretty well. This is the Bronx in mid 1980s. This is an interesting building at the corner. I, I wasn't, didn't have time to figure, figure out the address, but 1940, here we go in the mid 1980s. I think you get the idea. Anyway, I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions. So, um, I'm welcome to, uh, if you'd like to ask me anything, I'm, I'll do my best to provide some answers. And um, Michelle, I'm not sure how we're gonna do that part of it. If you have any questions, you can just put them in the chat. And then Ken, I don't know if you can see the chat. Right. At the moment, no, but uh, maybe you could read them out to me. Sure. Um, as of right now, we just have a comment that the tunnel garage was in Soho, not Tribeca. Oh, okay, sorry. All right, thank you for that. Uh, uh, is it possible just to ask the question? Sure, go ahead. Sure. 
<laughs> it's just a little easier. I wanted to get back to 50 West 13th Street. The Village uh, Preservation Society succeeded in preserving it. And I noticed uh, just in passing, I didn't have a chance to look at it, but it mentioned Bette Midler and a bunch of other stuff. So what was it, what was happening with that building? Uh, that's a good question. Is anyone with us from the Greenwich Village Society or his historic districts has any kind of updates on it? Do we know? Well, I just had a flyer about Bette Midler. I don't know. She's kind of a famous person. I was wondering what she did. She perform there? I guess she did. I yeah, believe, but so yes, she. Um, that was one of the first places she performed before she was known. Um, before she became famous. Last I heard, there is not much happening. I know the theater has closed, I believe, and I know it was cited okay. for redevelopment. I don't know if an RFE has been sent into LPC. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I guess, guess my only other question, I just, I, I got in a tiny bit late because I had the wrong link, but um, you were talking a little bit about the municipal library. I just had never even heard of it. What's the difference between the public, the public library on 42nd Street? Uh, uh, how is it different from the municipal archives? I don't know, does the, the city municipal library have archives at all? Or what is its coverage compared to say the public library? And just in terms, of, I, I get a better sense because I'd never heard of it before. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, well, as I think I mentioned, the Municipal Reference Library was established in 1913. It was a progressive era. And cities around the country were setting up, they call them municipal reference libraries, with the idea being that city leaders as well as citizens need to have access to information about their cities. Um, and okay. New York City yeah. still has its municipal library. It's one of the few left mm -hmm. in the country, maybe the only one left in the country. It's a division of our agency. Um, almost all the patrons who do research in the archives also stop in the reference library. Okay. Basically, the, the difference is the library contains published and printed materials about city government, history okay. of the city, and so on, uh, whereas the archives has the primary materials. Um, okay. Every agency's um, annual reports going back to the 19th century any kind of okay. books written, um, go on our website. They now, most everything is submitted electronically. So you don't even need to, you can do it virtually now. It's, mm -hmm. it's really quite an extraordinary resource. And as I was preparing right. this, I thought, you know what, this is, that's worth another whole, you know, another whole uh, evening's presentation because it's quite extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. Well, well it, <laughs> thank you, it's fascinating. You're welcome. Um, someone did put a link into village um, into the chat from a village preservation um, article. So if you want to go check that out. Um, but another question we have is where can I find city council resolutions from 1914? There is one changing a city street into a private alley, but we can't find it. Uh, municipal reference library is right where is where I'd start with that. They, that's the kind of thing you would find there, you know, resolutions of the city council, proceedings of the city council. Yeah, absolutely. Um, are there specific years that bound the birth and death records available? Yes. We have all the births reported in New York City prior to 1910. They start more or less 1866. There's some earlier, but 1866. 1847 is as far back as you can go, but the bulk are 1866 to 1909. Deaths start in, I believe, 1795 with a few gaps, and then they run right up to 1948. Marriages, again, 1847 through 1949. And for marriages, there are actually two different series. There are the health department marriage certificates, and from the mm -hmm. city clerk, we have the licenses, which was uh, starting in 1908, the state asked a couple to obtain a license before they married. So actually between 1908 and 1937, there are two different sets of marriage records, potentially. And what things are available just for access online and what things do you have to go down to the municipal archives to view? Okay. Well, the, the, the vital records that I just mentioned, the birth, death, and marriage, they've been digitized. Most of them, we're still working on it, but a good percentage of them have been digitized. You can access them right online on our website. 
We've got more than 2 million pictures from various collections, including the 1940 tax photographs, 1985 tax photographs. They're all online. Um, the almshouse collection that I mentioned, those ledgers, um, they've been digitized online. The early Dutch records digitized online. Um, but you know what I've just said is really a tiny fraction of what we what the archives contains. Uh, for just about anything else that I didn't mention, you probably need to come in person to do the research. I mean, we're digitizing as quickly as we can, but that's a it's a big job. Because I mean, the good news about the archives is that we have this record. The less than good news is that it's always 10 million things, not just a handful of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so if you were looking for something and you couldn't find it yourself online, who do you contact? Do you make an appointment to go down? Is there like a public room? How does that work? That's right. Um, starting when we reopened after you know what, uh, we went to an appointment only system. And it's, work, it's worked very well. What you do is you, re you send an email and there's information about this on our website. You send an email to research at records.nyc.gov and you say, I'd like to do research on that such and such a topic and I'd like to come in on such and such a day. Then one of the archivists write back and says, sure, that's fine. Uh, they have sessions in the morning and sessions in the afternoon. And it's, you can pretty much come in whenever you want. It's really not, it's, uh, we're very flexible with that. Um, but we do ask you to at least uh, let us know in advance, partly because if something needs to be retrieved from storage, we'll be able to do that for you. And also, we can direct you to the proper, to the right reading room. As I mentioned, we now have a reading room in Brooklyn for the, store, for the records we have stored out there. For reading room in Manhattan for the records we have stored here. So it kind of depends on what you're doing, where you'll get, where you'll be doing the work. Um. Are there any other questions? Uh, well, I was just going to ask maybe, uh, it's just fascinating. Thanks so much for this orientation. I had no idea. Anyway, uh, what are the users like, say, of the municipal record? Is it mainly scholars or is it just people want to kind of find out where their grandfather lived, you know, and or that sort of thing or personal stuff? I, I don't know if you can make a generalization, but um, it's funny. It seems like it would be a great source for academic work. Oh, yeah. In terms of the numbers of patrons, and we keep track of this, uh, we have to report our numbers. The greatest numbers of people doing research are people doing their family history. Oh, okay. After, um, another very big user group are people doing picture research for oh, books, uh -huh. publications, yeah. websites, and for, um, we have a lot of motion picture film too um, uh -huh. from, from WNYC, so we have a lot of people um, licensing footage for documentaries and films and things like that. And yes, we have a lot of academic people, you know, a lot of the colleges and universities in town know, know about us and they send their students down to uh, do work, primary research. Um, yeah, it's we're a busy place. I think that we take care of about 30,000 sort of research requests per year. It's, it's a busy wow. place. Amazing. We, we're we're the second largest government archive in North America. Wow. Impressive. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, it Julianne is. Bertanda, do you have a question? Yes, I was just wondering um, if you made an appointment, are you able to make copies when you're there or how do you take home information? Yes, um, you can bring people, you know, use their own phones now to take pictures of, of documents, that's fine. Um, we have photocopy machines, that's also okay. And if it's just too voluminous, you can pay us to do, we have a scan service, pretty minimal cost. We'll do that for you and then email you the records, you know, e email you the scans. Okay, and on that same point, um, you showed a blueprint that went to Department of Buildings for permitting. Are those... Yeah blueprints that I have seen recently, a very old blueprint from my neighborhood. And I, I live in a historic district and we are frankly starting to think about, can we create a book 
to preserve the history about people, place, and how we became a historic district. And um, one of the older residents actually had been passed on for, you know, from three prior owners, actual blueprints of their building that were from sort of the 1890s. So it was kind of unusual. I'd never seen that before. Where, where's, where, what district are you from? Treadwell Farm Historic District in East 62nd Street and East 61st Street between 1st, 2nd and 3rd Avenues. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, the, road, the, the plan collection that I spoke about, the, the blueprints, they're all 34th Street and South. And um, so for you and the East 60s, whatever extant plans there are, are still with Department of Buildings. And you can, you know, you can request, you can see what they can, if they can find them for you. In theory, they're still around. I think they're actually in New Jersey, but um, they do, they do retrieve them if they have them. But if you're below 34th Street, come to us and we can tell you whether we have the plans of your building or not. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I'll raise, raise my hand again. <laughs> um, I live in uh, Tudor City. I'm, all, I'm really fascinated by the, by the history there, just in personal terms, know, know the area better. Uh, and especially the whole issue about um, creating the historic district. Uh, it was a fascinating case with the Helmsleys involved. They, they owned it and uh, it was a very, very interesting period. Would, would that be, um, I guess that would be sort of what Julianne was talking about as well. This would be up, like, I guess, uptown or midtown. Uh, would, would, your, would the, would the uh, archives cover stuff like that? Yeah, when was, you said it was, um, when was it um, designated, Tudor City? Do you remember the, more or less the time period? Oh, that would be well. Actually, it was uh, it was built. It was founded actually in the 1920s, uh, right. and uh, I think that the Helmsleys, though, I think that was the 1970s or 80s. Um, well, they wanted to they wanted to build on the park on the on the parks actually, and so that went right. to the Supreme Court of New York, and they said no, you can't do that. And so then they was succeeded in in preserving it and designating it as a historic district uh, right. as a way to preserve it and present prevent other developers from coming in and destroying the parks. <laughs> but it well, goes back to the 20s, I think. It was likely that um, if the Helms were involved, they probably tried to get the mayor involved, my guess is, and the mayor's correspondence might might talk about that. It's quite possible. Oh, okay. Interesting. Um, wow. like you're, a little bit, you're just a little bit too far uptown for the plans to be in our collection. But oh, okay. again, uh, you're in the what, East 40s, I believe. Um, that's just a little bit too far north for us. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. It has a lot of ties with the UN as well, the United Nations. It was all stock, mm -hmm. stockyards down there before the, the 40s, I guess, before the UN. And so Tudor City was kind of, it was kind of a redevelopment thing and of its own private though. Uh, but it apparently was quite a slum, an Irish slum, before it was rebuilt as Tudor City. Um, so. Collections, one of our future collections, which is partially digitized, is from the borough president's office, borough president of Manhattan, because that oh. office built the East River Drive. And in the uh -huh. process of doing that, that just went right through what you just spoke of. So there's lots of pictures of the East 40s, um, uh -huh. you know, prior to uh, building of the East River Drive. So you get, um, you can pick up pictures there in that collection. Oh, wonderful. Oh, my thank, my thank you. You're very informed. You're a fond of sources. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, there's the pictures taken in 1940 of every single building on that one. So, yeah, yeah great. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Mr. Cobb, this is Julianne again. I have another question. I know I went to the Historic Society to see what they had. And there was, um, in, in the case of uh, Treadwell Farm, there was really nothing. There was more. Um, the Abigail Adams house, which you may know it's a museum and it was a like a boarding house at one point and that's further east. Um, mm -hmm. But there was not a lot at the historic society and way back when, because it's landmark, it was one of the earlier landmark districts. So I went through landmarks to find things. And like you said, I guess American Express had done some kind of 1980s review of landmarking places and they had something, but because Treadwell Farm Historic District was such an early designation, the file for landmarking, because it was within the first 
year to two years of the designation of landmarks, its file was very limited. Um, it was really more about the uniformity, the people in the neighborhood, the you know diversity of people, I should say, um, and that it was a planned community with you know width and height and block and lot sizing. You know, very specific builders were allowed to build multiple houses, and uh, so in a way, it was sort of a planned community. But um, your files would be beyond the tax files, which I've seen those. What other types of files would you think would be worth me researching on your end? Okay. Is it well, um, two things. One, the designation report, which maybe you've already seen, that would be in our library. Yeah, I have second, that. Okay, the second thing is, and this is, if you literally want to go back to, you know, the original owner colonial era, sort of a history of the ownership of that land. We do have that. It's a special series. I'm trying to think how I can describe it so that you can then request it as something that has to be retrieved. Um, you know, if you want to, perhaps Michelle could share your email with email address with me, send me what your email address, and I can then write back and tell you how to get this. It's quite a fascinating series that we have, but I just can't really describe it in a way that uh, makes any sense at the moment here. Okay. Uh, it literally goes back to when the, the original farms were being cut up into lots. So if that's of interest, we yeah, have Yeah, because what I do have is when these, it's interesting, I have now a better copy. I had a very, very bad copy for a long time, but the same neighbor that had the blueprint for their one home had the restricted covenant that was originally um, put in place in 1868. And so it had a lot of names, Titus and Buren or, you know, all these names yeah. were very colonial. Many of them were colonial names. So I um, am happy to share that with you. And maybe that does have something that would be uh, similar, um, but we can start talking about it offline and you can direct me wherever you feel yeah. appropriate because I'm happy to do some research on this. Um, sure. But the, you know, the designation report is pretty, um, you know, it references a few things from the uh, restricted covenant and it references some of the first builders um, and it re references the um, changing of the land, you know, and how much the land was paid for, you know, these developers paid for these four lots for X dollars, that kind of thing. Landmarks does fantastic work. They're very good. Yeah. As you, uh, as you well know, obviously. <laughs> That's your world there. So. What's the best way to look up people in homes? If you have an address and you want to historically know, is that census? Is that tax? Both, really. For census, we recommend ancestry.com or uh, familysearch.org. They're the best places for census. Census is a federal record. We don't have the census, except the, except that 1890 census that I showed you. But if you're looking who lived in one address, you would go through ancestry.com or family? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ancestry has made a deal with the Fed so you can get the, uh, the federal census through them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Somebody would like to know where the Brooklyn Reading Room is. It's an industry city, Brooklyn. Uh, like 41st Street, I believe. Are there any other questions? It's Julianne again. I have one more question, which is, do you also keep records of changing New York City maps? I know there's some map specialists out there, but you know, I know some people talk about that there's underground streams and places and these were filled in or whatever. Um, and as people think about rising tides and other things, I know this has become a topic, um, trying to figure out where the underground streams are and if they're under these old buildings or not. 
just curious if you know how to find out about that. The place to go is it's called the Topographical Bureau. It's in the borough president's office. They have an, a, quite a good map collection and they, exactly what you're talking about is there. Manhattan okay. Borough President's Office, Topographical Bureau, it's called. Topo. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's a really great question. I'm glad you raised that one. I'm actually kind of an urban geographer myself. I teach at Vassar, but um, I, the New York public also has a great map collection. They have a map room. Uh, oh, yeah. I don't know whether there'd be much of an overlap with you, uh, but uh, sounds great. The new collection is world, world class, yeah. And they've digitized a lot of it too, so. Okay, well with that, I think we will say good night. Thank you very much, this was fantastic. Um, once again, this has been recorded, so it will be up on our YouTube channel tomorrow, and all our other classes are also available there, as well as our virtual tours. Please check everything out. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Check out our website, hdc.org, and have a good night, everyone. Yeah, great. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, Mr. Cobb, thanks, thanks a lot. That was terrific. Thank you.